So welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you here to Awakening Our Democracy, Countdown to the 2020 Election. I'm Suzanne Goldberg, Executive Vice President for University Life, and thrilled to have so many of you here for this very important conversation at an incredible moment in the political season and the political world with uh, impeachment uh, proceedings happening as we speak. In fact, I was looking at my phone on the way over to check the latest news and watching a <laughs> moment of the proceeding as I crossed campus. Um, so we're going to have a tremendous discussion about the upcoming presidential election, about the recent midterms, about the role each of us has to play in this. Um, and I'll introduce our panel in a moment. First, I want to remind you that University Life is your hub at the University for university-wide student life information and for, for, for university-wide student life resources, opportunities to get involved at Columbia across with students and faculty and staff from around the university, and also for campus conversations like these to come together as a university community to discuss the pressing issues of our time, whether it's a session on how active citizenship can change our communities, whether it's sessions on race, ethnicity, disparities, and justice, whether it's the work we've been doing around 1619 and the legacies of slavery, or a new initiative in the Office of University Life, CU Engage, which is about engaging our full community, those who vote here and those who do not, in the political processes both in the United States and around the world. I think we can all agree that we are not, I, I, we wouldn't even say a polarized moment, but a polarized stretch of time. And I think none of us, or maybe somebody on this panel, but at least I don't have a sense of where that's headed and what, what, it, what the next direction will be. But it raising, raises pressing questions for us, especially at this consequential moment in our presidential history, in our electoral history. And that's uh, why we have a wonderful panel here to talk through the issues. So I will introduce them, and you may notice that some of them are different from those who were advertised, and we're grateful to those who were able to step in for others who couldn't make it. And I should also uh, let you know that, uh, unfortunately, Jamie Floyd, our moderator from WNYC, took ill this morning. So I will be subbing in as your moderator for the conversation. So let me introduce our panelists. Starting from the left is Rena Shaw. Rena was a, a 2016 delegate to the Republican National Convention and a former spokesperson for Next Gen GOP. She has served as a senior aide to two Republican members of Congress. She's a, stra a strategic consultant, an entrepreneur, a noted political activist, and is a regular on-air contributor and analyst on PBS, MSNBC, Fox, any place you turn, you will see Rena. She's also the, manager, the managing director of Red Fort Strategies, a public affairs and government relation firm, relations firm based in DC. Next to Rena is Professor Esther Fuchs. Uh, she's a professor, a renowned professor here uh, in the School of International and Public Affairs and also in political science at Columbia. She's a founding director of the Urban and Social Policy Program at SEPA. Uh, her expertise includes urban policy, politics and sustainability, workforce development and American parties and elections with federalism, ethnicity, race and gender being some of her key areas of study. Her New York City work is expansive. In fact, she just told me that she was called by a New York Times reporter moments ago to ask about working with Mike Bloomberg. Uh, she served as a director of who's on, I hope that's okay to yeah. share that. Uh, uh, she served as a director of the of who's on the ballot.org, an online voter engagement for new initiative for New York City. If you haven't seen it, I'm sure she'll tell us more. It's worth taking a look. She was special advisor for governance and strategic planning under Mayor Mike Bloomberg from 2001 to 2005. Then we have Amanda Farias, who is a lifelong Bronxite with a passion for public service. She worked on addressing voter suppression and mobilizing black and Latinx voters for President Obama, for Barack Obama's 2012, President Obama's 2012 presidential reelection campaign. And since then, she has worked in the New York City Council, helping to increase technology in schools, develop job training programs, and secure funding for programs that serve senior has worked also on the enactment of several women's health bills, and is also assistant director at the Consortium for Worker Education, where she manages workforce development programming in the Bronx. 
Next is Tony Fratto, who is a former deputy press secretary in the George W. Bush White House and a former assistant secretary in the Treasury Department. During Tony's time in public service, he led communications efforts for major economic policy issues, helped advance international initiatives, including trade agreements, debt cancellation for highly indebted countries, and global health programs to combat HIV AIDS. He's a founding partner of Hamilton Place Strategies, a public affairs consulting firm, and is a frequent on-air contributor for CNBC. So as I shift to my moderator role, let me just remind you of the format for Awakening Our Democracy, which is that we will have a conversation among ourselves, or I will help facilitate a conversation for the panelists. And then uh, in some t after some time, I will come out to you for questions. And that is an opportunity for the students in the room to raise questions that you have. And all we would ask is that you ask a relatively brief question or comment. And uh, remember to say your name and your school before we start. We'll collect those questions in groups of three when we get to that point. Uh, so now, to the panel. So I'm, how can we start a discussion today about the 2020 elections or even thinking about the most recent midterm elections without talking about where we are in this moment, which is in the middle of an impeachment proceeding? So let me ask you the question in this way, as we think about where we are politically and where we might be headed. Um, this, this, this conversation is titled Awakening Our Democracy. It's a long time series we've had in university life. How do you think about that in, the, in this moment? Are we in an awakening of our democracy? Are we not? Where are we headed? And why don't we just start with you, Tony, and we'll move down the line. Yeah, look, I think so. I mean, um, I, th I think there's, uh, you know, I, see, I see it from my, you know, from sort of my uh, viewpoint and experience um, and having, you know, worked in, uh, worked in uh, but, uh, you know, politics and Policy uh, for you know for a few decades now, but I also see through my kids who are both you know undergraduate students here in New York and from their perspective also and um, you know there, I, there's clearly a, you know a level of uh, awareness and activism that I think we haven't seen in a you know in a while. I think some of that came through uh, in the um, in the 2018 midterm elections, where if you're just looking for evidence. Of it, you saw more evidence of that in 2018. Um, you saw it, you know, you saw it in different ways, and I think maybe even a fall off, and even sort of a um, uh, complacency in 2016. Uh, amazingly, but I think that was, you know, clearly the case if you look at active, you know, uh, if you look at things like events and activity, and um, uh, certainly turnout, uh, and especially turnout among certain groups, there were significant fallouts from the. Uh, from President Obama's elections, so I think that's I think it's true, and I think you are I think you, you, like I said, there was anecdotal evidence of it. I think 2018 was some evidence of that, and I think we're getting pretty good hints. So we're going to have that level of activ activism in uh, in the 2020 elections as well. So part of how you're thinking about awakening our democracy is really the engagement of the citizenry, yeah. right? The, so, so Amanda, let me turn it to you. Yeah, for sure. I, th I think the first thing that came to mind was how, how 2016 definitely triggered 2018 um, and how we're seeing a new group of young people that are actually know the technological advances really well, the, like the digital sphere of politics and are using it really wisely or trying to expand the information that is out there. So even there, it's a, a space where we're, where we're now looking at politics or um, candidates or politicians are now looking at how to mobilize even in s with social media um, and that's definitely encouraging turnout <clears throat> encouraging flipping core states like we recently flipped Kentucky which was like pretty amazing from it going from red to blue um, so that's definitely increasing engagement and you know awakening the new side of like what does democracy look like for us locally which is such an interesting thing because I think there wasn't <coughs> the question of what does democracy look like hasn't been such an active question for a long time. I think there was a sort of sense of what it looked like, and people would agree or disagree about how well it worked. But 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 that is a question on the table now. Es Esther, what do you what do you think? How do you think about this? So um, I tend to look at the data and. Uh, Certainly, I'm susceptible to anecdotal stories and personal experience, but 
the data doesn't really tell a good story now. And um, while I think democracy is actually in crisis, I really do. And I think it better awaken or we're in really deep trouble right now. So, you know, you look at just voting. Now, I know there's tremendous other forms of political engagement that we all have to participate in, but um, since there's many students here, I'm, I'm going to do my thing, which is it's all important. You've got to do it all. Uh, protests are important. You know, calling your congressperson is important. Going on social media is important. Signing petitions. But if you don't turn out mm -hmm. and vote, we all lose in the end. And what I'm seeing in the data, if we, I think there is some light from 2018, but this is very precarious now. We have such a split field in the Democratic Party side. There's I don't really know whether or not the people who lose that primary, if their candidate loses, whether they will come out and vote for the winner of the Democratic primary. And I've seen that happen historically when um, young Democrats did not vote for Hubert Humphrey, Richard Nixon won. And so this is the story of American politics. If you don't believe that the elections are important, or if you take your game and stay home, uh, the person that you least wanted to win will win. Uh, that is guaranteed. We only had a 60% turnout in 2016, which by the way was up from 2012, and that was because voters in Trump's base turned out in larger numbers than expected, and mm -hmm. Obama voters, many not many, but enough, stayed home. So we know how to lose. In the Demo we know how to lose in the Democratic primary. We know how to lose in the general election. The question is whether or not people are going to take this crisis moment seriously, people who believe that, uh, that Trump is destroying our democracy, and I'm one of them. Um, but if everybody doesn't coalesce around the winner of the Democratic primary, um, yes, the democracy is not awoke. It's not woke. It's not awoke. Uh, it's definitely in crisis right now. There's not much that I would disagree with there. I think our democracy has been in crisis for a while. And I'm somebody that's sort of been hooked on a feeling for a long time because I've done politics in, in a very grassroots way. I've gone to states like Utah and Idaho and South Carolina and New Hampshire and lived there, um, made small sacrifices to go embed myself there with candidates and, and talk to people on the ground. And, and from what I hear from people, there's a sense that Washington is just not for them. Washington doesn't speak to them. Washington doesn't even represent them. Washington is a sort of almost another planet. And I think that feeling is exactly what got us to where we are in this moment. So does the country need to wake up? I don't know. I, I, I tell you, I, it, I felt like a couple of years ago, yes. I was a, a lifelong conservative that did not vote for the president. Um, I suffered some degree of uh, professional repercussions for speaking out. Um, the person who I think was responsible for silencing me is now behind bars, and that's a person by the name of Paul Manafort. And I can say that openly and freely because this is a country where I can speak without fear of political repercussions. But when I was in the Republican Party and I was an elected delegate, and I was told that if I went to the convention and I tried to vote against the now president, I would be taken out. I've received emails, death threats, things like that. That kind of stuff makes people not want to engage. So we already have a problem with engagement. And when you have a lifelong politico who's being threatened, and then these stories make their way out, people are sort of like, yeah, that's how it always is, isn't it? There's sort of these mobster-like tactics, thug-like tactics that people take on. It makes people, uh, and I was unmarried um, some years ago, it made me not want to engage. At some point I said, well, what's working in politics for if all of it is going to come down to power and money and people who are older than me and since 2016 what I decided was I have to go back in the Republican Party and I also have to work outside of it 
to create the change I want to see. And through that, I've seen that people are still not sure about this political moment. They're not sure what the Constitution means to them. They're not even sure that voting will really change anything. And so I say I'm hooked on a feeling because now my work, particularly since the end of 2017, when I launched Women's Public Leadership Network, we are going out into all the states. We're a nonpartisan organization, just giving women the resources they need to run, all non-financial, of course. The idea is that we get people to care. You have to change hearts and minds. And I think that's where uh, you all as an audience, you know, you're sitting in a position where you can choose to change your mind today, but you could also chose to change it yesterday. <laughs> but tomorrow is not too late either. So that's what I say. I say we can still wake up, but it, it's going to take each of us to understand the need and how you feel about where we are. There are conservatives who feel very left out and, and they feel like they must elect this president again. We have to speak to them if our values are different. So, so, so let me ask you, because each of you, you know, the, I see rays of optimism and maybe that's because I'm a glass half full person, so I'm always going to see the sun shining in. Uh, but also a reality check that even with all of these great ideas for engagement, there are some structural challenges, right? There, is, there are structural challenges related to voter suppression. There are also structural challenges related to, uh, it's confusing, right? We don't have a great system of civic education in the United States, and many countries also do not have a terrific system where people really deeply understand the constitution of the united states some younger democracies actually require the teaching of their constitution in higher education i just came back from bogota colombia where that is a required course for all students in higher education to understand the constitution but i guess tony you you had said you wanted to weigh in here so let yeah, me come back a, to you with yeah all just a little bit on that and i think it, i think it uh you know uh, it's relevant for that also. I mean, to Esther's point, I mean, there are we are seeing a change. So while I, I think I, yeah, I think we are seeing a, you know more activism in this cycle, it is very personality driven, and I think that's so. And like we saw some some of that was you know we saw that with Obama voters who identified themselves as Obama voters, and that's why they they didn't really show up in midterm elections for the Democratic Party, um, and uh, and that cost. The Democratic Party pretty significantly uh, in their losses. We're seeing that with Bernie voters, right? Bernie voters. It's not you know Bernie voters. I think um, you know we didn't see the levels of support for the party's nominee from Bernie voters in in uh, in 2016, and that uh, and that hurt um, uh, Secretary Clinton with, uh, with with in her race. The Republican Party has become Trump voters. Uh, they're identified with Trump, and they are super activated also. And that shouldn't be, you know, forgotten uh, on uh, on anyone who's you know, uh, on, on, you know as you're looking at the the 2020 race. They are super enthused. The party is a it's a Trump party. Uh, there's there is no room for uh, dissent. It's you know one thing from a, a delegate uh, to the 2016 campaign. Um, that's that's one thing. Look at you know Republican House members and Republican Senate members who look for dissent. It's you know it's a very lonely uh, a lonely group on any matter of uh, policy or politics. The structural um, uh, issue that comes down to it is like is that the fact that um, you know we we still come down to we're still going to come down to a half dozen maybe eight states where the race is. And so, you know, so your activism and involvement needs to be concentrated in places where it's going to have, where it's going to make a difference. So, you know, jacking up the vote on the west side of Manhattan is great. It may feel good, but it doesn't help you in southwestern Pennsylvania where you need to try to flip Pennsylvania uh, from red to blue. So, and that, which raises an interesting question. I know we have a local politics expert on our panel and, and somebody who's been very involved in local politics. So of course, when we think about the 2020 election, a lot of us are thinking about the federal election because it has profound significance um, in many ways. And we are going to s largely stay there. But I, I do want to give our local politics experts an opportunity to say something about what it looks like when you're thinking about local elections as well, since, since you've both been involved in one way or another, Amanda and Esther. Uh, I'll say something very quickly just to link the local to the national in some way too. So um, 
what people don't really, people don't, we have a very low voter turnout in New York City, actually. In the last mayoral election, it was less than 30 percent. I mean, it's kind of mind reeling when you think about it. Um, and that actually feeds into people's feelings uh, that you really talked about. Of it's, uh, the word in political science is efficacy. And while I don't like to use these terms in large <laughs> settings, it really means something very important, which is if you don't feel politically efficacious, meaning like what I do will make a difference. If you don't feel that people represent the, you, people like you, you stay home, you don't vote, and you don't engage in anything. <clears throat> and what we've learned from research actually is that it's at the local level that those feelings are created and that then translate into that action, both in uh, local elections, state elections, and national elections. So I would say it's actually very important. I would say, yeah, work on the west side. Work wherever the hell you can. Work everywhere and anywhere, even though you know the vote isn't going to make a difference you know, in how we count the electoral college for the national level. Because, first of all, it'll have an impact locally, which means something more to most people than the national stuff, except now, I would say. We're in a different moment now. But also, to the extent you pull those people in in something they can see and touch and feel like it makes a difference to themselves and their family and their community, they are more likely to pay attention and engage at the national level as well. So this is part of my, was my inspiration for Who's on the Ballot, which I encourage everybody in, you know, in New York to go to Who's on the Ballot. It's, it's nonpartisan. And it just gives you information. And one of the things that we learned is that it's actually hard for people to find out anything about down ballot races and about the local races. And to the extent we make it easier, everything should be easier. It doesn't say in the Constitution that it should be hard to vote, right, or hard to engage. We need to make it easier for people. So, and then you see, I'll come to you in just a second, Amanda, but you know, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with that statistic that among younger people, at least when American Idol was big, I don't know if it is still a thing, <laughs> um, but, but that more people were voting for American Idol than were participating in federal elections. Now, it's also true that we have a very international country. Many people are not eligible to vote for a variety of reasons, um, but I don't think that was the primary uh, sort of um, insight from the Amer disparity between the American Idol voting, which was easy to your point, right. and the actual voter registration and going to vote, which is not hard, but it also takes a different kind of effort. But let me turn it to you. Yeah, Amanda. I mean, for me too, it's very value based, right? The locality matters because it's that direct connection to mm -hmm. how people feel about what's where they're living, how they're commuting every single day. I know we all deal with Cuomo's MTA, um, so <laughs> we have that general sentiment of how that is. Um, but if we're not getting involved locally, and that's community board, that's running for county <coughs> committee, that's knowing the different levels of governance that we actually have here where we each can equally participate, that will bring better Democrats into the Democratic Party um, that will then translate upward into, you know, a unified Democratic Party. And there's there's a a large uh, progressive group that has a saying of like unify or die because what we did see in 2016 was a rollover of people that were burning or bust and did not translate to actually a unified Democratic Party. And that very much that sentiment very much is still alive. I think right now, both locally, um, where a lot of good or bad Democrats are being challenged because of people not actually knowing what they're doing, how they're voting. Um, there is no civic engagement or civic education in transparency of like how my daily life is being negatively impacted or positively impacted by the people that are directly representing me. So representative government, uh, people that look like us, people that our values um, directly you know, emulate or are represented is critical to a unified democratic party. So, so let me ask a follow-up question, and Rena, I'll go to you first, which is, you know, we're in a world when you, uh, if anybody spent time watching any of the Democratic <coughs> primary debates, I assume a few people in, the, in this room have seen that or at least followed the issues. 
Right, you look at a lot of people on stage or you read a lot of, about the, a lot of this in the media and you see people with very different views and it can be not only confusing but also hard to say, right? You like person A, but you like person A in part because you do not like the politics of person B. And, it, and I think that's a particular challenge in the Republican Party as you were just talking about right now. Um, and I don't mean to oversimplify, but, but how do you think about this when each party in our two-party country, as, as creaky as that and maybe unworkable as that is, when, when, when it's, it's a bit hard to stick with, you know, find somebody you like to support at the federal level. And this is, you know, whether it's Bernie or Bust or Trump or no Trump, how, how do you think about that when you think about our political process and what lies ahead in the campaigns of the next year? You know, it's tough because I, I get into this argument and more recently I got into it on TV, which I swore to myself I would never do. I, would, I don't like arguing with people. I actually hate confrontation and uh, it's just funny because now I'm on cable TV where I'm almost needing to do that. <laughs> and I, I ended up arguing with a, a guy named Mr. Fallon who worked for, for Hillary Clinton and, and he called my argument overly simplistic and reductive and I took that great offense to that right there on live TV. I was like, listen buddy, that's how we got Trump. That's okay. you're a so, woman and young, and that's what men do on TV. You know? Some men. Some. Some men. <laughs> company excluded. Yes, but you know, that was he's fair. Calling, he's calling my argument simplistic, and I'm like, right. that's how we got Trump. This stuff is you too up in the clouds own. for people. Mm -hmm. You know what? Why aren't we simplifying what's important here? And that's local elections, and that's what kind of gives me hope about where we're going forward. Yesterday was National Run for Office Day. I'm looking at Senator Gillibrand's video here on Twitter and there's runforofficeday.com is where you could have visited yesterday. Um, you know, I'm a former operative. I'm somebody that ran in a, in a hyper-local election, which was for delegate. And even I didn't know that. So there's a, there's a sense that we don't push out enough civic engagement initiatives. Um, and I bring up the TV thing because it's, it's easier to argue and say, well, you don't know this and you're framing this wrong and all that. Well, what can we agree on? Couldn't he and I have found common ground in that, in that moment? I think I was sort of striving for that, not trying to make myself look like I'm sort of this godly creature that wants to always do kumbaya on air. But I'm saying I was taken aback that he would call my argument reductive when we wanted the same, and we still want the same thing. We don't want the President of the United States to get reelected. So what are we doing in this moment? Why aren't we forming new coalitions? Why aren't we finding new ways to get people to understand what's happening in their communities? And why aren't we talking about sort of the elephant in the room? Is that the American electorate, the rising electorate, is changing. Unmarried women, I mean, this is a, a, a voting block that gets underrated, totally. Millennials, women of color. Up until, like I said, four years ago, I was unmarried. I'm a woman of color. I'm somehow still a millennial. I just make the <laughs> cut barely. So, so people like me were getting taken for granted, but I had this great family system that promoted civic engagement and that's how I sort of ended up being really engaged and now the challenge is how do I make my peers understand that that's the only thing that can keep us from being more divided as a nation and actually coming together in a capitalistic society where we're sort of division is sort of sewed for us isn't it so, sort of so pre-baked in. Yeah, yeah, so, so I guess I, I want to put the question back to the panel that you raised, right? Why aren't these coalitions forming? And to the extent they are forming, how do they form in a way that gets behind one candidate when the candidates are pointing in very different directions? And just to take the Democrats, right? One of the big debates down the line is Medicare for all or mm -hmm. Medicare for those who want it, or however you you know whichever you can pick your variation on that theme. Uh, but there are also different approaches to climate change. There are different approaches to to taxing corporations. There are different approaches to regulating tech. Different approaches to immigration. Uh, politics is is a world of compromise, but that's not people's everyday lives. So, no, so give us some insight here. Well, look, I, I mean, I, you know, um, every night in Washington, I'll tell you, is a uh, dinner of people like me uh, who have some experience in Washington and that and and inevitably the dinner ends up it's a bi usually a bipartisan dinner you know get some Republicans some Democrats some media and talk about issues and what's going on and I'm telling you every single night in Washington this is this is happening 
and you get around to the point of the dinner where you say, like, yeah, you know, this is, you know, it's, you know, remember the days when we used to be able to get together and talk about things and come to an agreement, and that's, you know, really what we ought to be doing. We have to be coming together uh, to try to find common ground on these really complex policy issues. And, um, and every day outside of Pittsburgh, or outside of uh, Washington, places like my hometown, Pittsburgh, there are people who are banging the drum saying, those guys in Washington are all in bed with each other. That's all they do is they get together and they, you know, they're, they're all out there doing their things together to screw us. And they are demanding purity. And it's not just on the right, it's on the left. There is a demand for purity on policy issues. And if anybody meets the standard of you know, purity on an issue, they move the goalposts further out because they're in the business of becoming ever more pure on whatever the issue is, whether it's immigration or climate or you know, tax policy or health care, whatever it is, um, there's, there's someone else out there who's going to be calling for more and more purity. And that is, that is pulling people apart. So even if you have people, we could sit right, and this is, a very, this is like very typical, very reasonable people, very nice people. We can throw, you could throw an issue out. I guarantee you we'll come to some then agreement on the things that we should do on whatever the complex issue is that you throw out there that we say we should go do. And if we walked out of the room and said, hey, we agreed, this is what we should do on climate, energy, tax policy, health care, immigration, there'll be somebody shooting arrows at us saying that you screwed your people, your party, your <clears throat> class, whatever it is, for agreeing to that compromise. And that's a dangerous, and now, because of, I think, social media, and we're meet regular, even traditional media are, is it's all exposed you know, immediately. You don't even have a chance to explain and roll out the compromise idea. While you're trying to explain it, the arrows are already you know, coming uh, inbound. So it's a very difficult, but we shouldn't th shrug and throw up our hands and say, well, so we're all screwed. You know, we just have to work harder at it and do it and do it in better ways. Can I just say, like, 100% yes to that? <clears throat> Sorry. Part of that, to me, still goes back to civic engagement and how much people actually know about our government and what's transparent, and also who is actually sitting at the table when all these decisions are being made. Right? We're used to older white men, more affluent white men, at the table making decisions for black for black, brown communities, for po impoverished communities, for women, for women of color. And so a lot of those people are, are looking and saying, like, those people are in bed with each other. It doesn't matter because decisions are being made way over my head. And whether I show up to the polls or show up to community board, my local issue is still going to be the same. Um, so for a lot of us in this room, um, it's about amplifying the voices of the people that are not at the table. It's not like, what your view is on that. <clears throat> Sorry, it's not what your view is on that. It's like, who's not in this room and how do I get them in this room to have these conversations and to give us their viewpoint that I can then help push. Yeah, we need policy making that's more reflective of America, you know? And I think without critical voices at the table, we just can't have that. So the question so is, can I just yeah, I want, I, want to, I want you to jump in and I want you to yeah. also help, uh, since you've studied political cycles for so long, uh, how do we get to this place, right, where, where there is, I mean, politics has always been a really tough business, right? I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's not new. I think your point is social media has changed the dynamic in positive ways to amplify voices and in very challenging ways. But so, Esther, help so, us out of this. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> part of it is there's a structural problem in the way we do elections here, which is to say <clears throat> most Political operatives, forgive me, to the political <laughs> operatives in the room, focus on <laughs> elections uh, in terms of uh, basically, and, and the people who are elected, let me get out the vote that I can predict that I know gets that, that, that shows up. Yep. So uh, what we call a mobilization strategy is something that's generally avoided in most political campaigns. We just try and turn out the people who we know are going to vote. Why do the public opinion polls, <coughs> excuse me, report likely voters? I mean, part of the reason they've been so wrong is because they can't predict so well the likely voters, which is the good news part of this story. But the likely voters are the ones that campaigns tend to go after unless they can't win with the likely voters. That's what Obama did. He mobilized. 
And part of the, you know, the problem is I see it, you can see it so clearly in the data. We're like, the population, the demographics of the population is changing. Everybody talks about that all the time. We're becoming an increasingly brown and black country. The demographic of the electorate is not changing at the same pace. We're over 70% white voters. And that in and of itself will tell you we, we still have disproportionate turnouts uh, in, uh, in um, suburban areas and in rural areas as compared to urban areas. If you look at all the divides in which we could figure out an increased turnout of a base of voters who could really move the needle here, I, I have to go back to the fact that we're not doing the turnout, the education, um, the basically convincing people that it makes a difference. And I, you know, I put that in perspective, obviously, because I agree with what everybody said about the changing media landscape. And I, I would just say that added to that problem now is the disinformation campaigns that are going on in both what was considered the mainstream media as well as social media now. And the difficulty, uh, not just the echo chambers and the bubbles that people find themselves in that just tell them what they want to hear, but also the difficulty people have of figuring out what's true and what's not true. And what, pe you know, whether, in, and this is to me the most serious problem. Um, and I, I am, I mean, we're sitting here in a journalism school right now. I am super concerned about this impact of the media on elections. And I would say everybody, if you read Amy Chosick's book, who covered Hillary Clinton for the New York Times, basically it's an apology for the way she covered Hillary Clinton. And so there is this amplification of the negative. You, your story was so telling in terms of how the conversation is more about um, you know, increasing those ratings, creating conflicts where they don't even really exist, because that's what people want to watch. And then, you know, the, you have MSNBC versus Fox. What is, what is that? That is not old style like I can figure out what a fact is. So you couple structural problems in elections in which we're making it increasingly difficult for people to vote instead of easier with problems in campaigns and the media. And, you know, we have a perfect storm right now. So, so let me just ask, um, Amanda, because you, you worked on mobilizing black and Latinx voters for President Obama. So can you talk a little bit about that? And then, Rena, you've done a lot of mobilization work, too. Sort of what, what have you seen that has worked? Are there things that you saw that worked in, in 2012 that you imagine might work again in 2020? Yeah, so I have, fortunately, I've, I've, I've done quite a few cam local campaigns, and then Obama's was obviously a national campaign. Um, but for me, it's always been the door-to-door -door interaction, the mobilization efforts of starting early and actually persuading those people to show up to vote is the, the crux of what actually increases turnout and um, what makes people have faith in, you know, in voting or in the system or in the party. Um, so door to door, I know maybe not everyone wants to go to like Idaho or Pittsburgh or wherever to, Everybody to travel. Everybody wants to go to Pittsburgh. <laughs> That's true. About? Philly cheesesteaks, for sure. <laughs> um, uh, but but it's, it's more about like the face to face. It's about having the persuasion to convince people that your one vote actually has so much power behind it because it's, you know, it's either increasing the visibility of this neighborhood or your city or your town. Um, even increasing, like mobilizing your own elected officials to show up for your candidate, right? There are multiple ways to get people to actually have a, a better turnout and have some, some faith in the communities or in the system itself. <coughs> so I definitely think that the face-to-face, -face, the person-to-person -person interaction helps deepen the connections of your individual issue in this city is the same issue I'm having in my city, even though we live like two different worlds apart. So that helps increase faith in the system. I think it's sort of like all screaming that like, you know, turnout is hugely important. It's almost like a cliche to say it, but like turnout is hugely important. And like Hispanic voters, look, um, you know, uh, Hispanic voters are going to vote somewhere in the, in the range of you know, seven out of 10, somewhere between seven and eight out of 10 for the uh, Democratic 
nominee. So you have to go out and get Hispanic turnout up. And by the way, it seems like it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, Romney, I think, got somewhere around 30% of Hispanic vote. Yeah. I think uh, Trump got around 29%. It was of it. almost the same. Almost the same. And, Ro and Romney didn't call anybody murderers or rapists, right? It's like, that's the floor. He didn't talk about walls, anything. And I said, that's the floor. But that just means every <laughs> you need to need to get the pump up turnout. You know what's interesting Wait, about the Hispanic vote? Uh, just a quick footnote here on the Hispanic vote, which is it's about registration. Hispanics are one of the lowest, next to Asians, registration groups. So you can't get people to turn out if they don't register. That's true. And people don't understand that that is a critical piece to the puzzle now. And let me just say, Rena, before I turn to you, uh, and then after uh, Rena speaks, I'm going to come out to all of you for your questions and your thoughts. But I, wa I want to just throw three things into the mix. One on registration, which is um, at the last uh, fed federal election, I worked at a the voter protection hotline that a lot of, it's a nonpartisan hotline. Uh, a lot of lawyers staff these to help people who are having difficulties on voting day. And it was a little terrifying because you have to quickly learn the law in whatever state is coming through your phone line. Uh, but they give you good handbooks for these things. Uh, but many people I talked to who are having difficulty voting weren't registered in the right place. And so I saw sort of a lot of what Stacey Abrams also brought to life in Georgia in her effort to increase voter registration is that, you know, as we know, right, it's a tangle. Some states make it that some men, many states now have same day voter registration. Many do not. And if you do not have same day voter registration, that can have the effect of ex exactly disabling people from voting, even when they do the mobilizing of turning out. But the other piece I want to raise uh, from the conversation is one where we started, which is uh, a lot of what you're talking about is not just getting in the voting booth, but the process of engaging somebody in the issues that will in part result in somebody casting a vote but in part result in engaging them more because a lot of economists would say, and those of you who have seen this literature know, right, does it make rational sense to vote? Mm -hmm. right? That time it takes mm -hmm. and the impact one is likely to have, um, uh, at least some of the literature would suggest it's not a rational act. However, what you're talking about, uh, I disagree. Uh, just to be clear, I don't think <laughs> no, you're getting no. a d agreement with that on this panel, but there, but there is a line of analysis in that direction. So what you're talking about going door to door, having conversations, getting people, helping people be informed is a critical piece. It's not just walking in the ballot box. So word over to you, Rena, for your thoughts on all of this, and then I'll come out to the audience. Yeah, to me, it's, it's literally <laughs> just going out there and figuring out how to get to each community, what's important for each community. And I think both parties have done a pretty bad job of it. Um, also, there are people that are just turned off by the way the parties operate. And increasingly, there are people that want to click independent. That should be embraced. Why are we sort of coddling this two-party system over and over? And, and I come from having worked an independent candidate, um, worked for an independent candidate in 2016, and, and trying to deny President Trump the Electoral College votes out in the West, and that didn't work. And so afterward, there was a lot of talk of how do we do this centrist thing? Is there a rise of the middle? Can a third party even, is this a time for a third party? These are all great questions. But unless we get to the heart of what's important in each community, those questions can wait for later. And I, I think that's just where I want to leave it and say that it's up to each one of us to exercise our right to vote. Um, yesterday I was at an international at Meridian International Center where I'm very happy to be part of their Global Leaders Council and, and sat at a table with a representative of the Embassy of Mexico and an Embassy of Japan and it was just such a cool conversation. And and I sort of get goosebumps during those conversations. I'm, I'm sort of a bit of a nerd when it comes to all this is that I just think it's so special what we have in our country. My family fled a regime in Uganda that was murderous and it was all because they wanted to murder us because of the color of our skin um, and because of our prosperity. And, and that can't happen here, it won't happen here if we all do our part, which is exercise this beautiful right we have to vote. So uh, with that, let me turn it over to you and we'll take questions in groups of three. So if there are some colleagues in the back with mics and they'll just come on over and if you could just say your name and your school and your question or comment. I see somebody over here. Just your name and your school. Great. 
Hi, I'm Drashti. I'm a grad student at the School of International and Public Affairs. Um, my question is for the two panelists on the stage that are part of the Republican Party. Um, if Trump is around to be the Republican nominee, and if um, Warren or Sanders becomes the Democratic nominee, will you vote for the Democratic nominee? And do you think other Republicans who are jaded by Trump will vote for the Democratic nominee if it's a very progressive candidate? Thank you. Uh, take a couple more. Hi, I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, my name is Karina. I am a first year student in Columbia College. And my question is, is finding common ground with each other and Republicans important for the Democratic candidates? And do you think the rhetoric of top Democratic candidates such as Sanders and Warren is alienating voter groups that are crucial for the Democrats to win in 2020? Thank you. Hi, I'm Jillian Drummond from the School of Social Work. Um, thank you all for being here, especially, um, I think it's great having a bipartisan perspective. Um, but to the point that um, civic education and civic engagement and how it affects voter turnout um, in uh, communities of color and unrepresented communities, um, it was said at the start that data doesn't always tell the whole picture. Um, so I was just wanted to clarify a, use, a few stats um, using Brooking Institute, actually, that, um, what is it, that uh, um, white voters, actually there's a, uh, there was a 70% turnout, yes, but 58% of them voted for Trump. And so we're here talking about awakening our democracy and our democracy being in crisis, um, but it was uh, white voters who overwhelmingly rep uh, voted for, for Trump. And the, um, to quote the, okay, here, the, I'm uh, sorry, I'm taking some time, but I think it's important to note that um, blacks have the highest voter turnout, um, more than statistics. In 2012, um, the, it was actually higher than whites, and um, it only dipped slightly in 2016. Um, so my question, I guess, would be, um, what do you want, what do you suggest doing? Um, what civic education do you suggest for white voters? Um, so that uh, um, they understand how their vote impacts, yes, their community on the local level, but how their vote impacts um, the people within their communities that aren't at the table. Um, and I just wish that there was less focus on um, uh, communities of color um, not being at the table without a discussion on also voter suppression. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, so a fantastic set of first round of questions. Um, let me, uh, who would like to, to jump in? Again, questions about Polarization and what? What? Yeah, I'll take, take one. I'll take one of them, which is the, the hardest. The hardest one. No. I'm sorry. I think the hardest no. one for me, which is on the on the uh, you know who would you vote for if? Um, <laughs> because as I tell all my Democratic friends, I'm like the easiest get. You know, it's like well, you know why can't you just bring home a nice candidate? You know why can't you bring home Michael? What's wrong with Michael Bennett? Why don't you guys like Michael Bennett? And you know it'll be easy for me. I support Michael Bennett or a whole handful of others. And I keep getting asked a question of this like this choice between Trump and a and a Warren or Sanders. And it, like it's not going to be. It's, I, I don't. I, I feel very very strong. It's not going to be Sanders. I. I actually feel pretty confident it's not going to be Warren either but if it if it were you know very honestly I think it's a very it's a very you make you make if you make my vote that difficult all right imagine what you do with the people I grew up with in southwestern Pennsylvania right it's a hard vote for me it's an easy vote for them all right they're not supporting Elizabeth Warren you go to the counties outside of uh, outside of Pittsburgh it's an easy decision for them. That's all. So that's all I'm saying. I'm the wrong person to ask. I'm now I'm a New Yorker. My vote doesn't really doesn't really matter all that much. I'm an outlier now in this Republican Party. It's those voters you need to be asking the question of, not not you know not me. Yeah, I'm also a terrible person to ask in the same way, is in that you know I, I go to my hometown in West Virginia about once a month and I just try to hear them. You know, I think people really just want to be heard more than anything else. And and they say, oh well, we we saw you and you know we heard that you're speaking out against the president. You used to be for the Republican Party. We were so proud of you when you were on Fox. <laughs> it's okay. Look, <laughs> the reality is I think he's a bad man. And if he was a woman, I would say he's a bad woman. 
because I'm allowed to say what I want to say. I just had a bad feeling about him. And there are people who also ran in the Republican primary that I did not like and I would call bad people as well. And so when we look at the left, what the Republican Party is going to do um, as we get closer to November 2020 is that they're going to say that socialism kills. And they say, if you don't want socialism in this country, click for Donald Trump again. And I, having studied the American presidency, I think that's just a layup for the Republicans. I think that argument is going to win with the base. Um, of course, all the numbers will say what they will. But I think the base is solidly with him. I think Republicans who are even on the fence when they look at the economy, when they see that we haven't had a large scale terror event, say we even have one. They want their strong man there to defend, the, you know, defend the country. I think you, you're just going to get the people um, who, are, who call themselves Republicans voting for Donald Trump again, unless it's, it's Joe Biden on the other side. And I, I, I know that frustrates a lot of people to hear that over and over, and I promise I'm not trying to be a member of the media by saying that, because I'm not. I'm not a journalist. I'm a political pundit. I opine on television. I'm telling you, I travel the country, and I hear Republicans say to me, if it's Uncle Joe, I'm voting tomorrow for Uncle Joe. And I've asked Republicans in Texas, I've asked Republicans in Florida, um, and I like to think that they believe that Joe Biden is palatable. They believe that Joe Biden will be a moderate, that Joe Biden will not uh, let the chaos that has been ensuing in Washington for the past three years continue. That we could go back to some degree of normalcy. But again, um, we are in such a unique moment in time and it's gonna be up to the young people old people, people of color, to just find their voice and click for who they think is going to represent them, who, who's going to take the country in a, in a better direction than we are right now. All right. So, actually, actually, if I wasn't clear, <coughs> just, just really quick, but to just be clear, my, uh, the chances of me voting for Trump are zero. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not voting or voting <coughs> for the alternative. Sorry. Or a third yeah. party yeah. candidate. Um, so just to put a little bit more data on the table and, and then answer quickly the question about the Warren versus Sanders, um, because of course you're right, the, just saying that in 2016, 73% of the electorate <coughs> was white doesn't tell the whole story, but when you look at the data, you know, going back to 1980 all the way to 2016, there is a change in the proportion of the electorate. In, tw in 1980, 80 seven, 88% of the electorate was white. In 2016, it was 73%. So we are, bec it's becoming more representative. But what's happening, in my view, that needs to be addressed is that as the population at large is becoming more diverse in this country, it's not catching up fast enough in the voting population, in those people who actually vote. The voting age population is not reflected in the voter turnout. And you're right about the, you know, the black vote, but the black vote has been pretty constant. It dropped a little in 2016 from 2012. But what I pointed out is really the Hispanic vote, which is very underperforming in terms of th where they are in the population right now. Hispanics are a larger percentage of the adult voting age population than African Americans right now. And they're not, either they're not registering, they're not turning out, and they're, uh, they're not voting consistently uh, in presidential elections. So I think that that's just data. You're right to mention voter suppression. Of course, I wanted to call that out again. These are structural problems state by state that have to be dealt, dealt with in a, you know, with a political action strategy, and it is happening. We have the Holder Initiative right here on campus, which is really focused a lot on the voter suppression issue through the courts, and, and I wanted to point that out. And then, you know, just quickly on the Warren-Sanders split, um, and <clears throat> I think it's a problem. I think, I think it's going to be a problem. Some, of, some people have echoed this already. Uh, for ultimately for turnout in the Democratic Party. What's, what's interesting to me now is there really isn't a front runner. The data, I just like pull the data and it's, you know, Warren Sanders, uh, you know, and Biden, now with Buttigieg surging a little bit in Iowa, they're bunching up. I, I don't, it's fluid. I mean, I could see Harris pulling ahead at some point too if Biden, if people decide Biden is not ready for prime time anymore, for example. Um, and then with Bloomberg potentially going in the race now, that really uh, opens things up. 
And what we know from previous elections is no one surges in Iowa or New Hampshire really surges ahead. Then the race is fluid, and we could conceivably go to a brokered convention. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Help us out here. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, the only thing I wanted to trickle back with was about whether or not these folks can actually work together. They're not presidential candidates right now because they have never found a way to work with the other side. Going over the aisle is something that every elected official will do um, so long as it, they're holding any position. It happens at our local city council, even though there's only three Republicans. Um, just because things showing showing that you have like unanimous vote on something is important. It's historical, so that happens. It happens at the state level, and it's definitely going to happen um, if and when we you know we have a, a democratic presidential uh, a, a democratic president. What I will say is about us holding more of those electeds accountable to this non purity idea. Right? I think right now people want the polar opposites. They want to feel like we're going to get Medicare for all, we're going to get um, the Green New Deal, like all of these things. And I think what really ends up happening to make it work for everyone, to make sure it's, like the assurance that it's going to pass, is that we end up with some middle ground and hopefully we have uh, folks that can move it more towards the more uh, democratic or um, in democratic small d, like democratic for local people, not party, not big D, um, but uh, pieces of legislation that can work for ev for all communities, right? That's what we want. But collaboration and cooperation happen at all levels of governance and will always happen. So this is fantastic. Let me, I want to go back to you for very quick. We're going to call this the lightning round. These are the sort of three more 30 second questions or comments and then back for very quick questions or comments over here. Hi, um, I'm, uh, my name is Lena. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Department of Music. Um, yesterday we found out that Stephen Miller had a very long history of sending extremely racist uh, emails to Breitbart.com prior to him being in the White House. Um, we also, somebody mentioned Stacey Abrams in terms of her, her election and how they found um, that basically she lost the election because of uh, voting restrictions to African American uh, voters in, in Georgia. Um, obviously we have a problem with race in this country and I feel that how are African American voters uh, feeling compelled to vote when first of all the White House basically has a house full of racists in there and it's not, and the silence and complicity of uh, Republicans and Democrats in talking about these issues is causing a lot of people to be dispirited in terms of the uh, voting process in America. Thank you. I think we have time for two more quick and then back to you. Uh, hi, I'm Max Feist. I'm a 3L at the law school. I, on the, you had said that the, the conversation about third parties really should wait until you talk to the communities, but I, I also think that that is something that can't happen unless you have ranked voting. So, so ranked choice you, voting, yeah. yeah. Do, do yeah. you, do, do, uh, to the, any of the panels, do you think that that's something that could happen in the future, or would Congress just not let that you happen? Nationally? Not, not happening, oh, just oh, like electoral oh, policy. Hold on, we'll, is come, not we'll come back. In our We're just going to get, get one more question in, and then we'll, we'll come back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm a PhD student in computer science. I wanted to ask the following question about engaging with people on the issues. I think most studies have shown that people primarily make decisions based on emotion and not reason, so for better or for worse. But my question is, you know, how do you engage with people who are emotionally committed to a candidate when you can't really talk to them about issues of policy? And I think we see this a lot, for example, with Warren and Sanders, where I've literally spoken with people who agree <coughs> with me that a lot of their ideas are unrealistic, but they still support them anyway. So incredible questions. I wish we had two hours, but we have five minutes. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. Each of you will get a minute on the climate. And I would just add to what you said. There's certainly a climate that I think uh, with hostility toward immigration is surely in part responsible for reducing participation by Latinx and Hispanic voters. Uh, climate, ranked choice voting, engagement on issues, emotion, mind. Uh, let's go. Uh, so very quickly, I have to say, uh, ranked choice voting. I mean, look, I, I 
tend to agree with Esther that the chances of it happening are not. But remember that we don't have national elections. We have state elections. So uh, states can elect their, uh, their candidates however way they want. So it's really a state issue, and so you have to go out. You can go out and force it, and you know New York uh, could be a great example, and uh, some of the other places are experimenting with it. Go and do it because, as again, I put my economist hat on, it's the best way to select anything and including candidates. Climate um, is, uh, remember, culture is way more important than politics or uh, economics, and that's hard for me to say as a political and econ guy. Uh, but uh, you know, nobody cared about Hong Kong. We, we cared about Hong Kong, but not the general public didn't care about Hong Kong until it became an NBA issue, and then everybody cared about Hong Kong, right? And then so now Hong Kong people start thinking about paying attention to Hong Kong. Once the NBA shut up about it, people stopped paying attention uh, to it. So culture is really important, and that has a lot to explain with Trump. Immigration is uh, as if no one's you know I'm a first generation Italian American. It's hard to find anybody to the left of me on immigration, um, but it is a it is still a driving issue, and it is going to be a, uh, an, a you know a, the, if you, 2016 was a warm up act for 2020, it's going to be just as bad and ugly, unfortunately. Okay, ranked choice voting, great locally, great statewide. I hope New York City is a good example for this, particularly if they actually educate black and brown communities and immigrant communities on how to use it correctly and have a baseline budget. That line is important, baseline by the city to make sure we have money to fund it every single year um, in terms of implementation and education around it. Then it could be a really great system for all of us. Um, don't really see it ever happening. It's like statewide, nation statewide. Um, immigration, I'm hoping that Latinx voters are more mobilized than ever this cycle because of Trump's agenda and how it's really, um, it's, it's really been hitting home for a lot of different folks, including after Hurricane Maria and how Puerto Ricans have moved to the states and are actively getting registered. I know because I've moved a bunch of family and have made sure every single person <laughs> is registered. Um, and the last one? Uh, emotion and also the, oh. the Afri African American oh, yeah, voters yeah, yeah, yeah. experiencing uh, so, not participating given the climate yeah, as well. So for me, it is culture, it is value-based voting, right? If we are not touching people and how in the community they're being impacted, they're most likely to not turn out. I see that happen here citywide all the time. We're not showing up in NYCHA. We're not showing up in black and brown communities. We're not showing up in immigrant communities. And so we have people that don't actually want to turn out because they don't understand the democratic process or uh, they only see their elected official when it's an election cycle, standing at the train, handing out lit, asking for their vote. Um, so for me, that's, that's two part, right? It is value based. We're going to move people to vote for the other person, hopefully, whether they're like, they're not Bernie or Bust this time, um, because we can relate to our values and our experiences and how like both of those people represent the same thing. Um, but also like how we're showing up in black and brown communities and pulling those people out to ensure that they actually come out to vote. Um, so just quickly on the ranked choice voting, I'm excited that we did it in New York, uh, and I'm hoping that this will be an example to the rest of the country. I think from, you know, in national races, it's just going to not happen. The Democratic Party conceivably could have put it into the primary pr voting process state by state if they wanted to, and, and it, uh, I don't see it happening over the long term uh, in any kind of concerted way. Um, in terms of this issue of emotion versus reason and uh, the, the what compels people to vote uh, I think uh, first of all that literature is a little complicated and and misleading I think it's the it's sort of like the literature about identity politics they say oh it's identity politics versus issues as if somehow identities aren't a shorthand way if you unpack them for people thinking about issues so I don't see um, I don't see these as uh, as dichotomous, I, because I think it's all based on a construct of defining what emotion and reason are, or what identity and issue are, in a way that's sort of disconnected from the realities of how people make decisions. So you can look look at the social psychologists on this, which is really interesting. So <coughs> we have to appeal to people on the basis of whatever 
we know is appealing to them. And sometimes, you know, they may respond to health care as health care as an issue. And sometimes it may be because they're elderly and subliminally, subliminally they're responding to the health care issue without even uh, articulating it that way. That's up, up to us. And then just quickly on, on, uh, on the issue of, of how people who are essentially often disenfranchised, disrespected, um, you know, not, uh, not feeling part of the political process uh, as it relates to race, ethnicity, and religion, all of which play into these kinds of things. This is a real thing, and we can't uh, wash it away in any way. And this is part of the American conversation that hasn't really happened in a sufficiently serious way, um, especially for blacks who have, uh, have a history that hasn't been acknowledged around slavery in the political process. And I think that's real and it has to be acknowledged. The one thing I would say in the short term, for all of us, if we stand back with our grievances, which we all have, about the political process ignoring us and our interests, our identity and values, then we give it away to the people who already have the power and don't really care about the things we care about. And so it's like my students used to say, oh, Tweedledum, Tweedledee, I'm not voting. They're, all, they're both the same. That was always the mantra. They're not the same. There are enormous differences between the candidates, and people are obligated as citizens in this country to make a choice even when they don't want to, even when they feel disrespected and alienated. Because if you don't, the other, the other side wins. Well, and I have a, a, a name for you, Senator Doug Jones in Alabama. I thought that was incredible. And I, I understand the feeling of feeling like the White House is stacked with you know, white supremacists. Uh, you're not fully wrong sometimes. Uh, I think some days I'm really shocked by the, the type of people that are in this administration because um, the policies reflect what's important to those people, right? And if they don't understand that diversity is our strength, and I think that's something we sort of as Americans just sort of need to push out there even more, that diversity is our strength. You may not be best friends with a black or brown person, but this country is different. And we are all, you know, I, I, I walk into a room not presenting as a five foot Indian American, daughter of immigrants, brown, millennial mom uh, who grew up in a really poor state. Uh, but came from a lot of privilege. I don't walk into a room with all that on my head. I walk in as an American. And I think that's sort of, um, it's incumbent upon all of us to sort of just walk in saying, I deserve to be here just as much as you do. And, and I went to the White House with that mentality two months ago for a Women Leaders Forum. People were shocked. They're like, you were the poster girl of Never Trump. What are you doing there? I'm like, hey, they invited me. I wanted to hear what was up. If they're having a Women Leaders event, you know, <laughs> I, I, have, I run a women's organization. If I'm not at the table, my perspective is missing. And I was, I was really, really shocked by what, what I took away that day. Not in a bad way, but in a good way. And so I think if we, don't, if we remove ourselves thinking, these people don't like me, they don't want me, um, then we'll never have the gains. We'll never have more Senator Doug Jones. Um, and, and I just say, you know, in it, obviously in our democracy, the ideal voter votes on the issues, right? Not along party lines. Um, but with all this talk of the issues, and as the daughter of a physician, the wife of one, sister of a physician, this Medicare for all talk sort of gets me riled up. But what I think at the end of the day, to your question, is that authenticity breaks through. That's how President Trump became our president. It's that feeling of connecting. He was authentic in a sort of sea of blah, 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 complex, complex, this issue, I'm here, I'm there. No, it's about the connection with people. And that's where I, I felt ver feel very strongly that all of us have to be authentic. I encourage everybody to run. I think everybody should run for something, even if it's hyper local and you want to be a local dog catcher, you want to be on the board of supervisors of your county, run for something. It's super important because the country is changing. I 
don't like to leave panels without giving a sort of um, a prescriptive type of read. And today's read for me, I read this on the train up from DC just a couple hours ago, um, is uh, How America Ends in the Atlantic. And it's written by Yoni Applebaum. You can read the rest of his argument at the Atlantic. And he, he, it, one quote stuck with me. It says, whether the American political system today can endure without fracturing further may depend on the choice of the center right. And I think that's where I'm going to put you there, my friend, <laughs> as well. I'm there. A lot of us are there. And, and these choices are, are important. So thanks for listening. So, so th thank you so much. And I, I was going to end the panel by asking each panelist to share their uh, suggestion for students, especially in the room, both US and non-US citizens, about what to do. But I think you've already heard it, which is that the point is to start to learn, to figure out what your local government is, wherever that may be in the world, to figure out what to engage with the issue. You don't have to follow every issue, but jump in on one. To run for office, at least I consider. I one thing. There's one weallvote.org, which is an initiative just launched by Michelle Obama. So weallvote.org. There, so there are when lots when of we all places vote. to, when we all vote, there are lots of places to learn, engage, whichever political system you are most directly a part of. So. Before we thank our panelists, I just want to remind you, you can find a lot more CU Engage events on University Life's website. For the students in the room, you get a weekly newsletter from us with great events in it, so keep checking that out. And please join me in thanking our incredible panelists for a wonderful discussion. That's fun. <laughs>